Well, thanks very much for all being here. You know, I know it was hard this morning in the rain, and so uh, so thanks again. So let me tell you a couple of words about you know what this is normally part of and how I normally approach classes and sessions. Okay, I also teach a lot in executive programs uh, and custom programs, and so. One of the programs I talk, uh, teach to a senior leadership at BMW. And as you know, uh, there was a whole diesel scandal or diesel gate. You know, I was teaching top management at BMW three days after the scandal broke. Okay? And, and to get them engaged was really not easy because they're talking to each other about what's happened to Volkswagen kind of stuff. Um, and that's where this, this session came, off, uh, came up from. Because you know, we started to look at what, how Volkswagen reacted to the scandal, and then started to look at how big corporations react to scandal. It's one of the things for you and, uh, and me not to react normally to scandals, but you see big corporations, there's very few corporations who get it right, you know. And what does it mean if they don't get it right? It means, of course, their share price suffers, their reputation suffers, their brand suffers, and what have you. And so out of that came, uh, came this, uh, this lecture, this session, which is, far much bigger than the 15 minutes you're going to see. But at least you give you a little bit of a taste about the kind of subjects you will discuss when taking a management uh, a course. The second way is the way I teach. And here at SFU, depending on what you teach, you have different approach. You know, if it's something highly quantitative, well, that's a lot of formulas and what have you, okay? But typical management is about decision making under uncertainty, okay? And so, so, so it's, it's about having a certain approach, frameworks, a certain behavior, so that indeed when you run companies, when you run divisions, that you can do that, that you can look at certain issues, see the problems, and then have indeed a process to solve those processes and indeed create value for shareholders, create value for stakeholders. Now, you all studied, you know, you all spent decades studying, you know, and if I would ask you like, you know, write all the things you've learned down and what you remember, you will see that probably it's, it's little, okay? You like, like, you probably, you could probably not fill a day with the things. And, and nevertheless, you spend years and years and years. And part of the reason of that is that education so far, and that is changing now, has about learning, about me telling you, you taking note, reading, and then reproducing what I think, you know, and that will give you an air something like that. Okay, that's not how management works. Okay, and you guys, you know, run, run groups or teams, that, that's not how things work. Now, that's why I like to teach with cases. Okay, why? Because cases tend to be a little bit unstructured. Okay, so the first thing you have is nobody tell you what the real problem is, or people tell you they have a certain problem, but you have to understand where the real problem is. And hence, cases allow you to do that. That's one thing. Secondly, Cases are about stories, okay? And stories we remember. And the reason why we remember stories is because the way our brain is configured, you know, or an emotional gland is, connect, is, is just next to our uh, long-term memory. And so when and if I can connect with, you, with your emotional band, what I am actually doing, I'm tapping into your long-term memory. That's why, for instance, your smell, which is also, you know, connected with your long-term memory, is one of the longest memories. You will walk somewhere and like, you smell and you think like, oh, grandma's cookies, okay? 25 years ago, but you cannot repeat what the instructor said yesterday. Yeah. Think about that. And hence, we want to understand it. I want to use that to indeed, you know, imprint learnings in, 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 in you. And so that's why we learn about cases. Now, teaching a mini case without you having gotten the case is a little bit more, you know, you know, challenging, okay, because normally you'll get the case to read, you get some questions, and then we'll discuss those kind of things in the class. The class is all about discussion, okay, because, you know, if only what you do is working hard, what's going to happen is you'll get all the work done, okay, but you won't get paid hardly as much as the people who take the decisions. And hence being able to communicate, being able to debate, being able to listen, you know, and being able to convince and inspire is all part of management, but it's also part of the case method. And so that's one of the reasons I like cases. This picture is four years ago, so I'm, you know, I'm getting a little bit older now, okay? So, so it's not morning, it's just me getting older. Good, let's see if I can get this working. So, so, so we'll talk a little bit about 
an example, which I already said is the diesel gate, and, and things we've learned from that, or things that research uh, shows us that as a, a, good, uh, a good approach. Good. So look at this. This is the share price of the company Volkswagen under its CEO, okay, between, you see, that left 2007 and 2015. So this CEO took over from the previous CEO, which had been a member of the original family who had created a reasonable amount of value. You know, he had people in charge, okay? And that has been his performance so far. So from around 50 dollars, uh, euros a share, all the way to 200 euros for a crack. If you compare that to the competitors, which are the two, are, uh, um, uh, Daimler, you know, be, uh, Mercedes on one hand, and, uh, and BMW, okay? The top line is, uh, is Volkswagen, the second one is, Mer is uh, BMW, and the third one, is Mercedes, okay? So over its present CEO and its present top management. So how do you think the CEO feels early 2015? How would you feel if that's your performance and share price? Oh. No, pretty good, okay? So, you know, you know, you're on top of the world, you go to all those conferences explaining, you know, how you, you brought a company which was even, which was already great. So it's not some company that was in the doldrums, no, no a company who had been great, even higher. And the way they had actually done that was by strategy. They figured out that they wanted to be the biggest car company in the world. Now to do that, they had to conquer the United States, okay? which was not easy to do because in the United States you have a lot of American cars, you also have a lot of you know, Asian, Japanese cars. Okay? And so the only way that they could do that was to, by providing diesel cars who actually had a higher performance, okay, but also didn't pollute. Okay, so they had kind of find the nirvana of cars, okay, and they have done that and had executed incredibly well on that, which explains us why that performance was so, so good. Then what happened? Okay, they get an, uh, an, an acknowledgement, okay, that two agencies, the EPA and the ARB, mentioned to them that they're going to investigate their cars, because there has been a small research lab who actually has tested their car, you know, in the real world, not in the laboratory, in the real world. And what they have found is that these cars were actually polluting, you know, massively, okay. How it turns out to be, okay, and that's important, how it turns out to be is, it was not by accident, they found out that there was a little cheating mechanism here, okay as well as an, an, a, an, a computer, okay? So this computer figured out when, uh, when only the front wheels were driving. And so when only the front wheels were driving, the computer kind of, you know, sent a signal and the bad NOxs were stored here. Why? Because if you test in the laboratory, you, put, you don't drive a car around the laboratory, you put it on some machine and then it drives, and then on the back end, they test amongst other for the NOx. And so whenever that happened, Okay, the NOx gases were stored here, and then later they were kind of released. Okay, okay, that's how they turn out to cheat. Okay, here is what happened after this was announced. So this is, you know, you can see before already, you know, there, you know, you often see that, and, and that's a subject of study about insider information and those kind of things. You tend to see adjustments. Okay, before you know, news uh, happens. You have the emergency acquisition, you also have that in scandals like this one. But that's when the news dropped that there's going to be an investigation. So about 35% of the value of, uh, of Volkswagen disappears within months. Okay, we're talking about here in two months. Okay, 35%, we're talking about more or less about $30 billion gone. You know, up in the air as people would say, uh, uh, how do you think you, f you feel now as a CEO? <laughs> yeah. that's, when, that's when the crisis kind of happens. Okay, that's when the crisis kind of happens. You know, and now the, you know, we, have, we have the second new CEO now, okay? uh, um, but, but it took a while. Okay. Now, let's focus on communication. You would think that a company like Volkswagen would be on top of that, would say like, oh, this is a scandal. Okay, we know what to do now, no, internally, but we also know what to do externally. Well, I'll show you a couple of clips. Okay, that's the best he can come up with. He says, I am resigning 
in the interest of the company, even though I'm not aware of any wrongdoing. How helpful do you find that? As somebody who's bought the car, you know, well, the main reason that you bought the car is because it polluted less. Okay? The person responsible for his strategy says, I'm out. Okay? Think about the shareholders. You know, shareholders, you put your trust in leadership, that's what you get. Now, does anybody know what Winterkorn did before he was CEO of the company? He was the head of innovation. So highly likely, if somebody knew <laughs> what was in this car, it's probably under his, under his watch, okay? But still as a CEO, okay? That's next what comes out. So there were rumors that their Audi, which is also part of the big Volkswagen group, had the same thing. So on November the 2nd, they come up to the statement saying Volkswagen wishes to emphasize that no software has been installed in this car and your units to alter emission characteristics in a forbidden manner. And then two, three weeks later, it has to say, well, one of the auxiliary emission control devices is regarded as a defeat de uh, device according to applicable US law. You know, if, if you read that, it, for me, it, it, it looks like, okay, there's something there that can be qualified, can, can quali which, which is used for something else. Okay, it's like somebody saying like, you know, I've been taking vitamins and now it turns out that you cannot use those vitamins for whatever. Or I'm, I have asthma and I'm using something, you know, and, and, and now the, uh, the anti-doping agencies in sports say I cannot use that. No, that was not the case. That device's sole purpose was to cheat. Okay? So, so think about how you feel about communication which is not straightforward after this has happened, you know. So they kind of dig in themselves deeper and deeper and deeper in, um, in the mess. In the meantime, and that's, you don't often see that, that investors come out in the news and, and start vocalizing what they feel. Okay, and I'm not talking about you and me, those are big institutional funds. Okay, one says the Volkswagen crisis communication to date have not left us with the feeling that the company has managed to get on top of things. I think that was Hermes. And another one says the press releases from Volkswagen seem almost purposeful designed to infuriate further investors and regulators with their obscure language. And hopefully from the previous example you can find it. And then the third one said Volkswagen has taken every opportunity to compound its trouble with US regulators and damage its image with consumers and investors. Okay? So that's what you get. And in the meantime, the stock price goes lower and lower and lower. Now, this has uh, ramifications for the entire company. You are a top professional in Volkswagen, and BMW has tried to hire you for the last four or five years. What do you start to think? You know? You are a potential customer who wanted to buy a Volkswagen, who always has been buying Volkswagen. What do you start to think? So we often only see the top layer and we see what the CEO is doing, but in every fissure of the company, those things has its effect. Okay? And one of the things you learn is that you have to take care of all those things when you're in those companies. Good. Actually, my colleague at Michigan said very well, the mismanagement of the crisis will be a classic case study in business schools around the world. And so, so that's why we like to look at it, what can you learn from it, and then what can you learn from it. So, when you're in a situations like that, first of all, to prevent to come in situations like that, okay, that's why we teach ethics too, okay? We're not only saying, what you, once you made a mess, what do you do now, okay? We're like, we also discuss why you should not get in a mess and how do you do that, no? But once you're there, you know, how do you run that? Good, and that's, that's a little bit what we're going to look at now. What do you think is the fundamental root of the problem when it comes to mismanagement of crisis? What's that? Owning the problem is important, okay? It's about, you know, that's, that's what leadership is about, okay? Having characters saying, listen, I messed up, no, we'll, we'll take it from there, you know, you have to start with that. But there's a more profound, deeper root. That's not good, okay? You shouldn't do that. Pride. Pride? Indicating that you have a solution. Yeah? There's a lack of the communication strategy. Communication is going to be important. 
Okay? But the root is indeed how we are configured. Okay? And that's where most problems always lie. Okay? Okay. It's not all of a sudden that all the bad apples in communication have been put together in Volkswagen. No. We see that over and over and over again. And why is Because it's human taking decisions in those kind of circumstances. And so what happens now, it turns out that you know, our brain is configured in a certain way that works very well in 95% of the circumstances. Okay? This morning when it was raining, you probably drove slower. Okay? You didn't need police to be around to explain you that. Okay? Or when it's red, you stop. Okay, or if somebody shouts, you look. Okay, okay, that's one part of our brain that gets activated all the time. Okay, it's when we think fast and we have to make snap decisions. And, and our life is like that. The whole day, that's what we do. Okay, and that's lying, you know, in a deeper level on the front. For other kind of problems, okay, it's another part of our brain that we have to use. And that part of our brain is slow. That's why we don't go there automatically. That's why the default is in the faster part. Okay? And it is a slower part which indeed analyzes things, diagnoses, looks at data, you know, and comes up with decision making. Okay? Okay, that's why, you know, if you take big decisions in your life, you know, that's probably what you should be doing. Okay? You probably don't buy a house like, okay, I like this house done mine. Or, I know, what's your name? Mary, I like you, let's get married. You know, those are fundamental decisions. And hence, you know, you want that other part of your brain at least to get involved in that. Okay? Now, typically what happens in crisis, which, bra which brain do we use? First, first reactions. The first reaction one. Okay? Oh, you know, like the ship is sinking, let's do that. Okay? Okay, or there's a branch, like, like, there's water on the right of the kayak, or there's everybody on the left of the kayak, what does everybody do? They all go on the right and end up in the water. Instead of you know, taking them first and listen, okay, let's move this around but so that we don't move in the water. <clears throat> That's typically our reactions. Also, if you go to a crisis like that, what do you think happens to your sleep? sleep. You can't sleep. You get sleep deprived. What is the natural consequence of sleep deprivation, our risk taking goes through the roof. Okay? Our overconfidence goes through the roof. And so in short, you know, we are not, we are not made, our brain is not made to deal with crises. So that's why if you don't have a process before crisis, <clears throat> we're going to do the wrong thing, we're going to shoot from the gate, we're going to resign, we're going to run away, all the things we shouldn't do. Why? Because it's all based on the left side. While what we should do is use the right side. Okay, good. So that's why I say those are the, uh, this is typically where uh, communication happens in, in crises. Okay, and hence what we get? We get wishful thinking. Okay, it's going to be okay. You know, people are going to get it. Okay, or group think. What do the others think? You, all, all to the left? Yeah, I think we should go to, I think that's a great idea. Okay, also, you know, you know, try to explain, like, yeah, but he said it. I, I, I really thought that we shouldn't do that, but you said it. Okay, or, or, or you think that's a good idea? Well, I'm going to write now an email to the CEO saying that that was your idea. <laughs> all stuff like that, all kind of, you know, why? Because that's not your protection. Okay, it's crisis. Some people are going to be fired rough. Okay, let's all protect ourselves. And why this is all fast thinking, bam, 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 bam. Okay, that's cool. You know, th that... Those, that research comes from a guy called Kahneman, Danny Kahneman, which wrote actually a beautiful book which is called Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, and he's a Nobel Prize winner. He has, you know, him together with Amos Tversky, who didn't get the Nobel Prize because he had passed away, their field of study has been decision-making under uncertainty, and they show all those things, you know, how they work. Here is where it indeed should happen, the communication, okay? As I said, you know, superior decisions are based on facts and data. Also, decisions that you take should give you more facts and more data to come to the right decision. Not trying to get stuff that confirms that what I'm doing is right and everything that doesn't confirm that, trying to hide that. Okay, good. So it starts here, okay? Have your priorities clear in advance, okay? And the priorities in business are twofold, okay? You have to focus on the business 
and you have to focus on the people. Okay, not just on my survival, especially the higher you are, the more it's about the people under you and the more it's about the business. What is typically the reflex? You look up and you don't look down. Instead of taking care of your flock and then telling the guys what, above you what you need to take care of your flock in a positive way, not in hiring stuff. It's all about, you know, what's happening to me and see which boss is going to survive. Okay, again, otherwise. And figuring out what has happened, what has truly happened. Okay, because that comes back to trust. Okay, you have broken the trust with all your stakeholders. Okay, investors, consumers, employees. Okay, we say, we use that word trust all the time. But what do we mean when we say trust? What is trust? See, a lot of you saying, yeah, yeah, they broke trust, but what is trust? What is trust? Consistency, integrity. Integrity is trust. Okay, typically that's what you expect from your friends. That they have a value system like yours or even better. That's what you expect from management. Okay, of the products you buy. Okay, of the services you get. That those people have integrity. But there's more to trust. What else is trust? Capability. Okay, capability. When you fly a plane, do you trust the pilot? With your life. He never met the person. But you trust the trust the person with your life. What are you trusting? That they're ethical? No. Or hope to, you hope that too. But you, you 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 believe that they're going to be able to safely take this plane off the ground, fly it safely, and land it safely. And if anything happened, to be able to deal with it. That's capability. Okay? Do I trust my friends with my money? No way. <laughs> okay, you should see some of them. You know, I love them dearly. They have fantastic in integrity. But they don't know the difference between a stock and a bond. Okay? Those are different levels of trust. Of those guys, you expect both. They have broken that. You know, and one of the things we discuss is that how do you build trust? Again. And it's typically, you know, first of all, transparency. From now on, I will not lie anymore. From now on, what I know, you will get. No hidden agendas. It's about empathy. I've heard you. I've heard my shareholders. I heard my stakeholders. You know, I will take care of them. Okay, and it's about rebuilding that trust, taking the same things. And hence, you want to see that. Okay, now. Typically, if you don't, haven't planned scandals before, you're going to get it wrong. Okay, so do scenario analysis. Get your management together and say, what do, are we doing if this happens? What are we doing if this happens? You're responsible for that if, you know, scandal goes out. If IT goes down, you phone him and him. He phones her and her, okay? We have a system in place. We have a manual in place. That manual is updated. We discuss it from time to time. Probably the examples that we have given will not happen exactly like that. But something close to that will happen. And we all know what we're supposed to do. So that indeed we have allowed our slow thinking to go through processes over and over again. And we see like we're missing that. We have to solve that. Okay? We will do a test run. I'm not saying over the next two months, you know. Boom, and, you know I'm phoning you, you know, it's on Saturday at 3 o'clock at night. And we see what happens. And we learn from that, so that when the real thing happens, we don't shoot from the hill, we follow process. And we have those processes in place. Okay? When it comes to communication, what you see too much, you know, and you see that, you know, unfortunately also with what happened in Iran, but, you know, with the Malaysian Airlines situation, okay? They are taken on the back foot, and they are on the back foot all the time. So you don't want to be able to answer the questions or each time to say to the, to the journalist, we look into that and I'll come back to you. That's a great question, give us two minutes. You want to lead it. You want to say like, we are doing this and this and this, this has happened, this we don't know yet. And so that's what we're putting in place to figure that one out. Okay, that's how you lead the talking points. Okay, you know, be proactive is part of that. Don't be reactive, okay? Speed is of the essence, okay? But at the same time, not to detriment that you you lying or you pretending stuff. Okay, be be and I'll put it there, be honest with the truth. 
If you don't know it, you don't know it. You, but you put the machine in place so that you are indeed uh, know, uh, discovering uh, those kind of things. That is an important one. Take care of the people. You will make errors. That's fine. People want you to see that you take care of the people. An example of that is Total, which is a, a big oil uh, company, uh, as you know. You know, they used to be the worst at all of that. Now they're one of the leading you know, uh, thinkers in the world on this subject of management and crisis and management communication. Because they learn it from the hard way. To give you an example, in, um, in 1999, Total had bought Petrofina, uh, which was a big Belgian oil company, and then had bought Alva Kitten. So they were actually integrating two companies. It's like running three companies at the same time. Okay? In December, um, I think December 17 it was, you know, management is talking, somebody comes into the management meeting and says, there's a ship that broke up on the coast of Brittany. 130,000 tons of oil is spilling on, on, on the shores. Think, you, think about your management or your the board. What is, what is your first question to me, you think? What do you think management asked the person? Which, which one? What's the loss? What's the loss? No, that's not what they asked. Been done so far? That, no, that's not what they asked. Which of the three companies? They asked, is it oil? oil? I said, so said, a ship with oil. They said, well, is it oil? oil? I'm like, I don't know. What do you say? What do you say if you say, I don't know? I Figured it out. Exactly. I'll come back. Come back. I'll come back. I said, you know, I got good news and bad news. The oil is all ours, the tanker is not. And the maritime law is very clear. It's responsible from the tank owner. It's not responsible of the cargo, which kind of makes sense. The only thing, the thing inside is not responsible for, for breaking up. So what do you think management said? Not a problem. And that's what they said in the press also. No, the the, the oil is ours, granted. But the tanker is not. Maritime law is clear. Guess what happened? They were vilified. Why? Because if you're a big company, you have to take moral responsibility. You know, who has to pay what is for the court of law? Okay, and hence Total has started to understand that. You know, to give an example, on the 21st of 2001, they had a big explosion in Toulouse in one of their factories. Okay, uh, about 20 people passed away and about 2,000 people got injured. What did we think everybody thought it was? This is 10, 10 days after 9-11. A terrorist attack. The CEO, didn't say, the CEO was there within an hour. And so, okay, like, do you think it's a terrorist attack? The CEO said, like, like we don't go in there now. You know, we're going to take care of the people. What we want to do now is help those people and those families which are suffering. So that's for the police to find out. You see, like, that is the way you want your, 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 your CEO to communicate. So that's why, I don't know if you guys saw the movie on, um, on Deepwater Horizon. Okay, with the big explosion in 2010, April 2010, you know, where uh, BP had oil spilling, you know, that is unforgivable. Okay, the, the, the CEO Hartwood said the same thing. The oil is ours, but the platform is not ours, and it's responsible from the owners of the platform. Now, this was us 10 years after Total. Okay, then he went sailing with his family, took, took holiday. And when he came back and the journalist was saying, what do you do, what's happening? He said, I want my life back. 11 people died. You can so see that, you know, you, know, you know, there was no place for a CEO like that to be head of search company. And that's what I mean by indeed taking care of the people and indeed understand your uh, more responsibility. The next one is be generous with the truth. Okay, be honest. Okay, understand your moral responsibility, you know, and also understand this. And this is going to be an important one. Understand where the story is happening where the narrative is happening, okay? And we have something helpful that, which is called the, uh, the, uh, the reputational terrain. What you're looking at, okay, is two, uh, two vectors. One, where you look at the audience interest, so the interest of the audience can be low, nobody cares, or everybody wants to know about it, and the societal importance, okay? Which means, you know, a lot of people can be interested, but for society, the importance is zero, or very close to. Or it can be high. 
And so depending where the scandal takes place, you need another kind of reaction, another kind of narrative. But to give you <coughs> the, the bottom left, we call the simple reporting. That's typically what you see all day long, all the news flashes that come out. Okay, bam, bam, bam. Most of that is nobody kind of cares. Okay. Now, on the right side, you have things which you see in, in cable news and what is called infotainment, which is a lot of interest for the audience, but for society, it doesn't have any importance. The fact that Angelina and Brett are back together, you know, <laughs> you know, millions of copies of Hello and Soul on the back of that, it will not affect society. Okay? And then you go to the top, and that's typically where scandals take place. Okay? You have what is called in-depth coverage. Now, if you read The Economist, that's what you get. You get facts, you get data, you get expertise. Okay, you also kind of tend to see that on things like CNBC, okay, or on financial news wise, okay, where they interview the CEO or a politician. I will talk about the GDP growth, was a half a percent bigger than expected, we're doing fantastic. That's those kind of languages. Or unemployment is that, or what have you, okay. And then from time to time, you go to the top right, okay where it is a big importance of social, uh, uh, for society, and a lot of people are also interested. Now, where do you think Volkswagen took place? Top right, that is totally correct, top right. And CEOs are not prepared for that, because CEOs go on television and they talk top, top left. They talk about facts and data, and the more they do that, the more people say, oh, he or she is lying. Look, they're hiding behind their expertise. And while the CEO is, is sometimes only trying to explain what has happened, but in a technical matter, because that's how she and or he talks all day long. Okay? And indeed, Volkswagen is, was indeed in the top right. Okay? In the top right. Good. Now, when you're in the top right, it's not about facts. It's about the story. Okay? Here we are after storytelling. Okay? And the story typically has three... Um, three person, three types of person. Okay, it has a villain, <coughs> it has a hero, and it has a victim. Okay, and you can put a lot of them in. You can put Enron there, you can put Arthur Anderson there. Okay, people are after those three things. Okay, and so unless you can explain that you are either the victim or the hero, you're going to be the villain. Okay, and hence you have to be able to talk in those terms. So that's why often, if it's a really a big scandal, that's why the CEO has to go. And that's why often an external has to come in. Okay, because somebody internal will always be seen as well, it's just another villain. Okay, and hence a lot of companies don't understand or don't prepare the CEOs to go indeed on Fox or CNN and be able to talk in storyline. Okay. Now, it's not only in business that we see that. You know, we see that in politics also. You know, and uh, this is not a statement on who I like or don't like. You know, this is just, you know, applying this model. That's where Hillary Clinton was. Okay? And that's where politics often takes place. Okay? And that's why voter interest tends to be relatively muted. Okay? That's where, I like doing that, yep. <laughs> That's, that's where um, Trump was, okay? What has happened and what, what, what I think, you know, the Democrats had missed is that indeed a lot of the U.S. had gone there. Why? Because over the last 20 years, the system has not been working for about 85% of the Americans. You take the bottom 85% of the United States, they're worse off than they were in 1990. Okay, so there was a, a whole bunch of people there which are not happy. And so you come up about GDP and inflation, and like, they don't want to hear that. They see it again as somebody else who's just putting sand in their eyes so that the top 1% can get richer. Okay, and he didn't talk like that. I'm not, know if he can or not, but he didn't talk like that. He always talks and still today talks in those three terms. Okay? Who was the victim? You, the US voter. Who was the villain? The other politicians. And look at the primaries. They were all ganging up on him. And he was saying, look at the Jeb Bush and all those guys. You're going to vote for them? You are in the situation that you are because of them. And the more they ganged up on him, the better he did. 
They didn't get that because he was indeed talking in that language. Every scandal that they've thrown at him, he has either been, he has either been able to spin it as he was a victim or he was a hero. Most of the time he starts being the victim and he's the guy who becomes the hero. Again, I'm not saying, you know, politically, you know, I'm just saying it's this understanding where the discourse takes place. And CEOs are typically not prepared for that. Good. I'll leave it here. It was just to give you a little bit of an example of what the kind of things we discuss in class. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope I see you all back next year. Take care, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we're going to get you back to work pretty soon, um, but I just want to, uh, again, uh, I guess, uh, welcome you again to um, SFU BD and uh, welcome from my, uh, from my team. Um, you've met a number of them here. Uh, we have a couple of our team members at the back. You met a couple of people out front. Uh, I realized, uh, you know, we just took this photo a few months ago, but we've now grown by two, so I'm really happy about that. Uh, Many of these people are the ones that, uh, I, that you'll have the opportunity to talk to one-on-one. -on -one. We do invite you after today, if you're interested in, in uh, one of our programs, to set up an advising appointment. We're very happy to, to talk to you about our programs. Um, so about us, uh, just you know, to talk about uh, you know, the mission of the school and, and what we stand for. Um, this, this is the building uh, of the Siegel Graduate School. Uh, here in Vancouver. Um, we're very proud of the fact that uh, we, you know, we're in the top 1% of schools in the world uh, with dual accreditation from AACSB from the US and Equus, which is a, a worldwide uh, accreditation. Uh, it takes a lot of work. Uh, we know that we actually have someone on staff who, uh, who deals primarily with accreditation requests. So uh, we know how much um, uh, documentation is required for that and, and what a feat it is to actually accomplish uh, both of those accreditations. Um, we're also proud of the fact that uh, we, we stand on three pillars here at, uh, at SFU BD. Uh, we stand on the pillars of uh, global mindset, on innovation and entrepreneurship, and social responsibility. And those are three things that you will see weave throughout the program. Uh, you'll probably be lucky enough at some point uh, to, in, to encounter you know, our great uh, team um, that looks after innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, often I bring Andrew Harries, who's, who teaches entrepreneurship in all of our programs, uh, to conduct a mini class. And so you'd have the opportunity there to, to learn about uh, you know, what we do differently in terms of entrepreneurship here at, at SFU BD. Um, we have a number of programs. I'm not going to go through all of them. I mean, I'm not going to describe all of them, but you'll see here we, we do have a full suite of programs that we're very proud of. Uh, we look at uh, after people throughout the whole life cycle of their careers after their undergrad. Um, so we've got a full-time MBA program that's a one-year program that takes place here. Um, it's highly international, uh, uh, has a lot of diversity, and we're very proud of the fact that uh, in most years, uh, we reach gender balance. It's something that we're very proud of. In fact, I think we've, we've hit, hit that target or very close to it 10 years in a row. Um, it's, uh, you know, I think that's an amazing feat and something that we should be proud of, uh, especially when a lot of business schools are still hovering around 30% representation for women. Uh, a few years ago, we launched the part-time MBA in Surrey. We just started our latest cohort at the beginning of January. A terrific program, it was a, it's our fastest growing program. Um, in fact, it's hit capacity in just a few years. Um, and uh, it's a general MBA that runs for two years. We have a great group of students there, very experienced uh, with an average work experience of 11 to 12 years, uh, which is also what you will see with our management of, uh, management of technology MBA, the MOT, which uh, is held here in downtown Vancouver. Uh, and that one has a tech focus, and it's, it uh, looks after people from the tech, uh, with uh, tech backgrounds, people who are interested in careers in technology. Uh, and again, very experienced group with 10 to 11 years of experience. 
Our longest standing program though is our executive MBA and it also stands as the longest standing uh, executive MBA in Canada. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary last year onto the 51st year and I'm very proud to say that in the 50th year, again, we almost hit gender <laughs> balance um, and it was something that we thought uh, would be a long time coming but we were able to achieve that uh, in this past year. We're also uh, proud of the fact that we run the only uh, executive MBA in Indigenous business and leadership. Um, that's a very experienced group that uh, has uh, an average work experience of 20 years. Um, and we're recruiting for that program right now. We're, we're actually expecting to expand that program nationally in 2021. So we know there's a lot of demand for that, that program and uh, we're very proud of the fact that uh, we, have, we are serving that need for Indigenous communities. Aside from that, we have a, a few other graduate programs. Our MSc Finance program uh, is also highly international, but uh, uh, it's a great program. Actually, Jan uh, teaches in that, or has taught in that program. Um, the GDBA, our online program, uh, which has uh, just passed its 20th anniversary. And we also have a program called Eye to Eye, which takes PhDs in science and engineering uh, who have a business idea and for a year they go through a mini MBA and they, they learn how to take their ideas to market and they, they really hone their pitches and the, the program culminates in a, a big event where everyone pitches their ideas. So that's uh, eye to eye. So that's, uh, you know, look at our graduate programs. Uh, like I said, you can talk to any of us about uh, these programs if you're interested. Um, when we talk to uh, our, our students and our alumni about their motivations for doing an MBA or a master's program, they often uh, talk about um, these three motivations. First, you know, they're looking for a change. As you see there, I've been doing well in my career but want to change and I'm feeling that there's a barrier to doing that. We hear that all the time. Uh, a lot of people want to take this program because they want to advance in their careers. Very natural. And I, I will say that I've had a long career um, in the MBA world. Uh, I've worked with MBAs for over 20 years on both sides of the admissions table, first as an admissions consultant and then as uh, an admissions advisor and admissions director. Um, so I know that story is very common. Uh, and what I will say is that the MBA in my opinion, is a transformational degree. It's the one that really advances people the most um, of any degree that I've seen uh, because it takes people from very diverse backgrounds and really propels them forward. And of course, um, a lot of people are already happy in their, in, in their positions, uh, but they want to thrive. They want to continue. They want to feel more excited. Uh, they want to feel engaged with their organizations. So. Hopefully, you know, you're here and you're thinking about doing one of our programs and I'm sure that uh, your motivations fall under one of these three categories. Um, so I just want to wrap up today with uh, what you can do next. As I mentioned, uh, we invite you to connect with the staff today. We do have a, a bit of time if you're not in a rush to get back to the office. Um, we're all happy to talk to you. Uh, check your email after today. Uh, we'll give you some more information, plus uh, uh, PDFs of brochures of, of uh, the programs that you're interested in. Uh, I talked about advising appointments. It's actually one of the great features here that we, that we do offer, uh, one of the great services. Um, you've in, you've uh, attended this event. Some of you I know have attended other events. Um, we do in encourage you to call us up and you know, sit down with us for 15 minutes to half an hour talk about your motivations, if you have any questions about uh, you know, what, what it takes to apply to this program, we're happy to, to oblige and we're happy to, you know, to continue that conversation after today. Um, you've had this great experience today with the mini class. Um, we have these from time to time, so you know, make sure that you look at uh, our website on a regular basis. But we also um, invite you to, to um, come to a full class, um, to, to sit in with our, with, um, our MBAs. 
uh, you know, book a class visit so you can do that with our staff as well. Um, very important, I'm sure many of you have already done this, uh, connect with current students and alumni. A lot of students who, who come to us have been recommended by friends and colleagues and uh, who've gone through the program and that's certainly um, something that we really value. Uh, but I know also that in this age of, of social media, people are already reaching out. Uh, I know our international students in particular reach out to people all the time on LinkedIn. So do that. I mean, reach out to people who've gone through our programs. Uh, we, we know that uh, they'll have a lot of positive things to say about their experience. And as I said, how transformative it can be. And uh, in terms of uh, next steps, if you've already decided that you do want to pursue a program this year, then we encourage you to apply online. Uh, we have rolling admissions uh, with several deadlines for all of our programs. Um, all of that information is available on the website. Um, I'm just curious, did, was anybody here for our event last night? Well, welcome. Well, welcome back. Uh, <laughs> I was there as well. Uh, we had an event last night called BD Talks. Uh, we actually have uh, another one coming up on, on March 6th. It's International Women's Day. Uh, we held one last year, uh, and we're going to have uh, an event again this year. And I know the topic of that is on women in male-dominated male -dominated industries. And that's a school-wide initiative, uh, BD Talks. So uh, we invite the wider community, prospective students, current students, alumni. We've got a lot of faculty and staff attending that as well. It was a great event last night. I think we had uh, more than 350 pre-registrations and it was, I, I, the room was about 95% full. I was at the back of the room be, standing because there were hardly any seats left actually. So it was great to see that. And we got to hear from Sandra Stewart, the uh, CEO of HSBC Canada. Uh, and in terms of some other events, uh, like I said, we've got a full calendar. Please uh, uh, keep in touch. Uh, for those who are interested in the GDBA, the Graduate Diploma in Business Administration, uh, that's a program that's actually a great stepping stone to a number of our programs. Uh, it ladders into the full-time MBA, the MOT, and the part-time MBA. And next Tuesday, I will be co-hosting a webinar with our academic director, one of our current students, and Sumi Benning, whom you would have met uh, out front as well. Um, so that's our information webinar, six o'clock next Tuesday. And another big thing to put on your calendar, we're telling you to save the date. Uh, February 29th is, and this is the first time we're doing this, uh, and it's an event that is catered to prospective students. Instead of uh, doing a full overview, of just overviews of the programs, we're doing something different this year. We're actually doing a, a career um, summit. It's a Business Matters Summit, Up Your Game for Success. We've got a lot of great speakers coming. Uh, a lot of, uh, we have a number of CEOs that will be there. You'll have that opportunity to interact with them. Um, we have um, a keynote. Uh, and so you can sign up for that on our website as we actually develop the schedule, you'll, you'll see more and more details coming through as well. So we, we put on all of these events uh, because we want you to really see what the community is like. Uh, and I will say I've been here for a little over a year um, and I used to work at UBC. I always heard a lot of great things about SFUBD and certainly now living here and working here, um, I can say that they're, they're true and one of the things that's really stood out for me is that sense of community amongst alumni, students, and certainly as a staff member, I really love the, collabor uh, the, the collaborative uh, nature of the work that we do. Um, and I think that that you know, is, is certainly testament to you know, what a great place this is. So I hope that you did enjoy your morning. Uh, and uh, if you do have further questions, um, myself and my team are certainly uh, welcome to uh, continue to engage with you this morning and, and beyond. So thank you very much to all of you here in the room and also to those of you who are tuning in uh, online. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone.